Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, only he's worthy. Only he's worthy of our adoration. Come on, he's the one that heals our bodies. Hallelujah. He's the one that delivers us. What an honor it is to be here. Great looking crowd, most of you. But it's good to be here in North Carolina. And thank God the Razorbacks won. I admit I was praying a little bit. And I'm glad to be here with your pastor and his family. My dad was very close to him. And uh, good to see John Tackett. I live in Ward, Arkansas, not far from Lone Oak. So I go there quite often. And it's good to be here. I just want to tell you that I don't deserve him. I was a 21-year IV drug user. I was a violent man in and out of jail so many times I couldn't even tell you. I've been arrested more times than Otis a drunk on Mayberry. <laughs> I, was, I, I had alcohol addictions from a very early age in my life it was it tried to overcome me by the time I was 12 I smoked my first joint when I was 13 I lived in a preacher's home I stuck a needle in my arm for the first time before I was 19 addicted to every kind of drug you can think of I, I go all over the world telling people and helping drug addicts and I've never met one yet that was addicted as I was. And if Jesus can deliver me, you can't tell me he can't deliver you. I should be in prison right now. My plea bargain was 40 to life in prison. That's what the state offered me for 13 class Y felonies. I was, my motto was, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly bear. <laughs> but Jesus found a way when there was no way. Come on, Jesus found a way when there was no way. So I'm a late bloomer. I didn't start preaching until I was 42. Just kind of, my dad said I was slow. He said I didn't get my birthmark till I was eight. So <laughs> And as I stood behind the pulpit at Arkansas camp meeting on Friday night, as I was closing out our camp meeting preaching, I couldn't help but remember that in 1983, that was my last service, was at that very spot on the campground. Come on, God knows how to bring it full circle. Come on, some of you think you've done too much. I come to tell you Jesus doesn't look at you that way. If he did, I wouldn't be here today. If he judged me for everything I'd done, I would be dead right now. But no, he's seen who he created me to be. He didn't create me to be a drug addict. He didn't create me to be an alcoholic. He created me to be a preacher. Come on, he created me to be a worshiper. He created me to be a soul winner. Come on, he created me to be a witness. And I feel led in the Holy Ghost to tell somebody right now, Jesus doesn't see your faults. He looks past your faults. He looks past your sin. And he sees who he created you to be. And he wants you to step out of the darkness today and step into his glorious light. In the name of Jesus. Sorry I gave you some scriptures, but the Lord kind of changed everything. Matthew 1, verse 18. My brother asked me, 
He said, what's your title? I said, getting fired from Jenny Craig. He's so skinny, he don't even know who Jenny Craig is. He said, who's that? I told him, I said, he had his one stripe in his pinstripe suit. <laughs> Doctor, I beat anorexia. <laughs> now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is... Come on, God with us. God with us. Come on, he was more than just a man. Come on, he was God with us. Come on, he was more than just a man. He was God with us. And I want to preach about that God today. And his name is Jesus. And I want you to lift your hands with me one more time. By the authority of the word of God. And by the power that's in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I loose you right now into this place. I speak faith out of my mouth right now to loose upon this place right now in Jesus' name. I come against sickness. I come against disease. I come against infirmities and addictions right now in Jesus' name. God, you created our bodies and you know how to heal our bodies. Lord, I'm asking you to begin to move right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I bind every spirit, unclean spirit that is not of you. I place it under my feet. You either leave or you be silent right now in the name of Jesus. I take dominion and authority. You have no place here. This is the house of God. Now in the name of Jesus, I loose you, Lord, to touch every heart, touch every mind, touch every body. <laughs> Lord, touch my mind, touch my voice, and touch my body so I can go into battle, Lord, right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody, in the name of Jesus. Come on, say it again, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. All through the centuries of time, it has been prophesied in the word of God over and over how the Messiah was going to come. For thousands of years, Israel always held on to this hope that the Messiah was going to come. Through famines and droughts and pestilence, through bondage by kings and kingdoms, their hope rested in one of these days the Messiah is going to come and we'll be free. Priests would pray for the coming of the Messiah. Prophets would prophesy about the one coming to set us free. Come on, the one that would wipe the tears away from our eyes. The one that would open up the blind eyes. Come on, I've seen blind eyes open. I think he can do it today too. Come on, the one that can open up deaf ears. I've watched hundreds of people be healed of deafness, and I believe he can do it right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, I was in a service last Sunday where they were carrying walkers out. They were carrying canes over their shoulder because my God is still the healer. Yeah. 
2,000 years ago, in a dark cave carved into the side of a mountain, it was a stable for sheep and barnyard animals, nasty, filthy, with the smell of animals in the air. The Messiah had arrived. He was announced first to shepherds and wise men. Kings would try to kill him, but he was here, the Savior of the earth. And I can hear the prophet Isaiah's voice as it echoes down through the centuries of time. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born. Who is that child? Come on, who is that child? And unto us a son is given. Who is that son? And the government shall be upon Jesus' shoulders. And Jesus' name shall be called. Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. Don't you let anybody tell you that Jesus wasn't the Father. He's the Father. He's the Son. He's the Holy Ghost. He's the sheepfold. He's the door to the sheepfold. Come on, he's the lily. He's the rose. He's the sun. He's the bright and morning star. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Then verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Come on, I come to tell the world that my Jesus wasn't a second person in a trinity. There's a forum out there of preachers, they all need to repent. And one of them was criticizing me about preaching against the Trinity. I asked him, how many did you baptize last year? He said, eight. I said, I'm on over 300 right now this year. You ought to try it a little bit. You ought to preach what the Word of God says. My Bible says Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. My God is God alone. Jesus doesn't doesn't need any help. Come on. He was there when the stars was created. He'll be there when the earth melts with a fervent heat. He's the first. He's the last. We're about to shake hell's gates today. Come on. I come to tell you I'm not afraid of every devil in this town. And if you don't believe there's a devil, you need to hang out with me for a little while. My wife was taking me to the airport yesterday, and I promise you, within one hour, out of nowhere, one lady started screaming at me. I said, what did I do? She said, nothing. I went... Another guy, give me the one finger salute. We're in Walmart, and the guy comes walking towards us, and he goes, I'm like, well, dear Lord, a dude tries to run me off of the road on the freeway. She looked at me and goes, good Lord. I said, welcome to my world on a Saturday when I'm at the airport because the devil hates us. Come on, I've had him walk up to me in the airport and growl and curse me. You know why? Because he knows that he can't do nothing to me, that I'm a child of God. I've been buried in his name. Come on, I got the name of Jesus covering me. You need to quit walking around in fear. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you walk in a dominion like no other I'm sick of people 
talking about how the things the devil does. Well, I'm going to tell you some things that Jesus does. I worry about people. All they see is devils. There's twice as many angels. If you're going to see something spiritual, that's what you ought to be seeing. John 8 and 57. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious. I'm glad I don't belong to a religion. And he says this to him. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old. Thou hast seen Abraham. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. When he said, I am, all those scholars, come on, all those educated people, they knew that he was telling them, I'm God. Come on, you don't have to look no further. I'm the I am. Come on, then he tells them in John 10 and 30, he says, I and my father are one. Now, I've been told I look like my dad. That really hurts me. My dad had to chase a water fountain to get a drink. He was so ugly. He was. He knew it. I've been told I'm growing like my dad. Lord, help me. And I sound like him, but we're not one. When you see Charles Mahaney, you don't see Nick Mahaney, especially since he's in the grave. We are not one. Jesus is letting them know I am the Father. We are the same. Jesus was the only fingernails of God. Jesus was the only eyes of God. Jesus was the only hands of God. Jesus was the only feet of God. Come on. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen the face of God. In Matthew 16, they're asking him questions. Or he's asking them questions. Whom do men say that I am? Well, they stumble and mumble, Jeremiah, Isaiah. They don't know what to say. John the Baptist. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus says because certain people believe there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. Is that politically correct enough? And Jesus tells Peter, he said, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, hath not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. Now, I'm not, only thing stood between me and college was high school. But I know to be a person, you have to have flesh and blood. And Jesus is telling them flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Father who's a spirit up in heaven. And if you believe that dove's a person, I'm not hunting with you. Come on. There was only one flesh and blood, and his name was Jesus Christ. And he walked this earth for 33 and a half years. And you know what he did? He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He cast out devils. And he said, greater things you're going to do than I did. Come on, you got to raise your faith. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. God is waiting for a boldness for you to walk up to the sick. Lay your hands upon them. Colossians 2, 9, for in him, in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. At the age of 30, Jesus performs his first miracle. Through him, blinded eyes open, deaf ears unstopped. You know what? He's the only person I know of that canceled funerals. Think about that one. I've seen weddings called off, ball games rained out, rodeos called off. 
But I ain't never seen somebody says, uh, we're going to have to cancel the funeral. This brother's alive. He canceled funerals. He stopped a funeral procession. They got the, the kid laid out. He raises the dead. The Bible says only God can raise the dead. Come on, he's my savior. Come on, he's my healer. You don't have to leave here today like you walked in those doors. You just have to get desperate for Jesus Christ. You understand that there's something about the name of Jesus. You can say, Nick, all you want. You might think of buffets, fried chicken. I'm 57. I turned 57 Monday, this past Monday. I know it. <laughs> Trying to keep my waist not the same as my age. And I've noticed the older I get, the more friends I've got, the last name, Ologist. I'm like, everybody I know is an ologist. And every once in a while, I don't know about y'all, but I get a little bit of pain in my body. Come on, or I get a sickness in my body. And guess who comes to my rescue? I call on his name. Come on, first, of, first before anything, I call on his name. And he always shows up right on time. You can't say the name of Jesus without something not happening. You know why? Because when you say Jesus, every angel in the universe stops. When you say Jesus, every devil in earshot's legs begin to tremble. When you say Jesus, cancer starts vibrating and having to move out of a body. When you say Jesus, diabetes has to flee. Come on, when you say Jesus, heart disease is gone. Come on, because that's nothing like the name of Jesus. There are right at 2,000 titles of God in the Bible. He only has one name. You know, the angels didn't know his name till God sent Gabriel to tell Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Adam walked with him in the garden. He didn't know his name. Moses talked to him in the burning bush. He asked his name and he said, I'm the I am. He walked with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. They didn't know his name. Isaiah saw him high and lifted up as his train filled the tabernacle. And he began to say, and they shall call his name. Every creature in the universe held its breath. And all he could say was wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. Lucifer didn't know his name or he'd have never let him make it to the cross. Come on. And now he believes in one God. You hear me? One God. One God. And trembles at the name of that God. 2,000 years ago, he was revealed as he hung on a cruel cross of redemption. As he paid for our sins with the crimson cash of his blood. And I come to tell you, that name is Jesus. That name is Jesus. That name is Jesus. He's brought before the governor of Judea named Pontius Pilate. The Jews have already tried him in a kangaroo court where he's accused of heresy and blasphemy. Now these are 70 men that are, the, they're not the scallywags, they are the most revered men in all of Israel. We got it in our minds, these guys were horrible men. No, they knew every line, every word in the Old Testament. And they were chosen because of their lifestyle, their purity, 
and how they lived for God. They were chosen because of their lineage and their bloodlines. So these were not just any ordinary men. And they find him guilty. The Lord revealed to me about forgiveness not too long ago. You see, they asked Jesus, Lord, how often should we forgive? He said, 70 times 7. Well, I thought, man, that's a scallywag, 240 times a day. I mean, I've been bad in my life, but I've never done 240 things wrong in one day. I tried. And the Lord told me to dig in and study. You know what that was? That was exactly seven days before he stood in front of those 70 men. And Jesus was letting you know, if you want to be like me, I'd already forgiven the 70. That's why I had nothing to say. You want to be like Jesus? You better quit holding that grudge. Come on, you want to be like Jesus? You better start forgiving. Come on, I can't make everybody be like me, so I can't look at you critical. Because if I want to be like Jesus, I can't look at you and have a judgment against you, but I can look at you and forgive you. Come on, I can look at you with eyes of forgiveness. If you want him to forgive you, you better learn how to forgive yourself. It's the custom of this court. When you're found guilty, these 70 men line up in front of you and they spit in your face and they slap you as hard as they can. He stands there as 70 men spit on him and slap him in the face and then he's led away to prison where God only knows the horrible things he endured that night at the hands of the Roman prison. Now he's brought before the governor and their custom is once a year to let someone go and he brings out a murderer and an upriser named Barabbas. Here's your choice. Jesus has never done one thing, no sin, or Barabbas a thief and a murderer. The crowd begins to chant, crucify him, crucify him. We want Barabbas. So they grab Jesus and they push him through this. I want you to picture in your mind a crowd going crazy because they're bloodthirsty. They want to see somebody's death. And if you're not a Roman citizen at that time, Here's what happened. If you're found guilty, all men were scourged first, which is beaten, then nailed to a cross. The only people that wasn't beaten first would be women. They wouldn't beat them. They would just crucify them. So they push Jesus through this crowd. Now they're reaching out and they're hitting him. The Bible says they pulled handfuls of his beard out. They're spitting on him. And they push him behind Pilate's hall. Josephus says behind Pilate's hall was a massive courtyard and in the, it would hold hundreds and hundreds of people. And in that courtyard was one pillar standing tall. It was there for one reason and one reason only. And waiting around that pillar is a squad of soldiers. They have been trained to be cruel and hurt people. You see, this is generational their fathers have taught them this and their grandfathers have taught their fathers. And they take this modest rabbi and they push him towards these soldiers and the first thing they do is strip him naked. This to him was one of the most embarrassing things in his life. He was brought up to be covered and modest as a teacher and now he stood up naked in front of the whole world. Naked in front of all his peers. Naked in front of all his family. They knock him to the ground. And as they kick him and beat on him, one of them grabs his left wrist and they tie it as high as they can to this pillar. And they stretch him. And they tie his right wrist to the other pillar. His feet are barely touching the ground as they shackle his left ankle and then his right ankle. They got a table in front of them. I challenge you to go research scourgings. And on that table are clubs, whips, chains. 
anything they can inflict pain on. Usually they start out by beating you with a club so your senses are gone from you. Then they would take an eight foot long ox hide whip and they'd put one on the left and one on the right and they would lay that whip across his back as fast and hard as they could beat him. This wasn't designed to tear the flesh, but it was designed to soften up the flesh. As they laid that whip across his back, red angry whelps jumped up on his skin and they beat him from his neck down to his feet for about 15 minutes until they're out of breath. Then they reach over on the tables what they call a flagrum. I know people say it's the cat of nine tails, but that was never called a cat of nine tails until the pirates. Think about it. It was called a flagrum. It was a long wooden handle with strips of leather coming out the end of it. It had ball bearings that caused deep tissue bruising. It had pieces of sheet bone and wire, pieces of glass, and they would lay that whip across his shoulders. And when they did, it hung in the flesh, and they would have to rip it off of his body. As they tore that loose from his body, there would be a red mist of blood and flesh and bone coming through the air. And they would begin to flay him alive. And they would beat him and beat him. Then the ribs would start showing. His spine would start showing. They could see his internal organs and blood was pouring out of the cavities in his back. The cross was for our salvation. He didn't have to be beat. But he knew we needed more than a savior. So he said, if you don't go, if I don't go to that whipping post, there's a man named Nick Mahaney bound by drugs and alcohol. Come on, his mind is tore up. Come on, he was wounded for our transgressions. Come on, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. Come on, depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide. Come on, we're upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Come on, right now, in the name of Jesus, if you need a healing in your body, I want you to lift your hands. Come on, lift them. By the authority of the word of God and by the power that's in the name of Jesus, because of that beating that you bore on your body, God, I speak a healing miracle to begin to flow through this place. Come on, I speak everything. Come on, in the name of Jesus, that your blood covers to be healed right now. Come on, speak it. They cut him loose. They cut him loose. He falls to the ground. Do you understand that they cut trenches around that pillar because so much blood would pour out of his body? They called it the half death. Not because they beat you half to death, because half of everybody scourged would die. He lays there on the ground. He begins to retch and vomit. He's going in and out of shock. The pain is so severe that he's in and out of consciousness. And they jerk him up to his feet with his back exposed, with his legs ripped apart. Now, I know some people teach that it was 39 stripes. That's if the Jews beat you. The Jews did not beat Jesus. Go check your Bible. The Romans are the one that scourged them and they beat you until you was almost dead. Then the Bible says they put a crown of thorns on him. A reed in his right hand mocked him. Then they put his own clothes on him. And they led him away to be crucified. He's already weak. And they put a 120 pound, 100 pound cross member of solid wood on his shoulders, lashing it to him, kicking him. They push him through the crowd. They're hurling things at him. He's already going in and out of consciousness. He he, he is in shock. I mean, he is in such pain. 
They have to have a man helping carry that cross member up the hill. You see, in that time and place, it was not uncommon to see people crucified. If you wasn't a Roman citizen, they'd just crucify you. When Jesus was in his 20s, they had an uprising in his hometown of Galilee. They sent in five legions of soldiers, and they squashed this uprising, and they crucified over 2,000 men in that uprising all around where he lived. He knew what was going to happen. He said the joy of the cross. He wasn't afraid of that. So what the historians say is they would tie your bicep to the cross. Tie your left, tie your right forearm to the cross. They would stomp on your wrist and take a seven inch spike and they would drive it in through the, start at your palm and come out the back of your hand at an angle. All your nerves end in your hands and feet. And they said the reason they had to, they learned to tie them is because once that nail pierced their hands, they would start flopping on the ground. And they said people would tear themselves loose. Taking the loop, they put it over his left wrist. And they would pull him to stretch him as far as they could. Usually his shoulder or elbow would dislocate as they tied that other bicep to the cross. And then his other forearm to the cross. Taking another seven-inch spike, they drive it into his hands. And he begins to scream in agony. The pain is so severe. All the pictures have him way up high on a cross with his feet on a platform, but that's not how they crucified people. That's pictures that were painted by Europeans who had never witnessed a a crucifixion. See, they found the bones of a first-century man at the time of Jesus crucified. And it was nothing like that. They had an upright stake, and the Romans were so cruel. They wanted to crucify you at eye level with your family so they could walk up and see your pain and suffering. And they would pick up that cross member as he's nailed to it and tied to it and drag him over to that upright stake and drop him down. They would bend his knee. And they'd take the point of that nail and they'd put it at the space between your ankle and your heel and drive it through the Achilles tendon into the cross. They'd move over to the left knee and bend it. And they'd do the same thing. They wanted everybody to see how he was suffering. They said that if you had a baby, they would kill it and hang it around your neck. That's how cruel they were. Or they'd kill your children in front of you and hang them on the cross with you. He hangs there for six hours. The flies and maggots are already coming out of his flesh. Infection is already setting into his body. And he is sagged down where his lungs are compressed. The only time he can get a breath is to push up on those heels and pull up on those hands. Take a deep breath and sag back down until he couldn't breathe anymore. That's why there's not a lot of things said on the cross because he could only gasp for air. He did say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Three hours in the sunlight. Finally, the sun couldn't stand looking at him anymore like that. And darkness enveloped the earth. And he said, it's finished. He didn't say his life was finished. He didn't say everything was finished. He said that dispensation was finished. Because when he said it was finished, the veil of the temple was tore from the top to the bottom. When Jesus said it was finished, the Spirit of God burst out of the holies of holies because no longer was there going to be pigeons or turtle doves or lambs or bulls or goats because the lamb, the sacrificial lamb for the whole world had just taken the blood that was going to be need to wash away our sins. And you still won't give your life to him. You still want to play around with God. Look what he's done for you. I first got in church. 
I struggled with all kinds of addictions. And I'd go to the church and I would just lay on the platform. Jesus, help me. And then my father passes away. How am I going to make it now? I was laying there in the darkness one day. I said, Jesus, Jesus, I need you. And when I opened my eyes, there he was. But his face was tore apart. His eyelid was hanging down to here. His lips were broken and split. Teeth were all broken. But I seen love like I'd never seen before in my life, Brother Tackett. And I knew right then, if he did that for me, there's nothing I won't do for him. Come on, I come to tell you, he did all of that so you could have your sins washed away in baptism. Come on. He did all of that so you could have eternal life with him. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody now. Come on, you've been on the fence waving about whether I should be baptized or not. Well, that ought to tell you that you should be baptized in his name. Because I come to tell you that he, you're, you're going to have eternal life. You're either going to be with him or you're going to be in hell. Come on, there's no in-between. There's no purgatory. I preached a men's conference last year. And there was a man there that come up to me. We went to eat. Said he was raised in church. Dad was the preacher. Mom was a Sunday school director. He said, at 18, I said, I've had enough. I think I can, I got time. He's a Hispanic man. He moved to Phoenix. And he began selling drugs with the cartel. He owed him money, and they started looking for him. He told me, me and my girlfriend was sitting in the house one night. We were expecting somebody, and so when they knocked on the door, we didn't think nothing of it. He said, I walked to the door and opened it, and there was a man with a bandana on his face with a pistol. A 38, and he just started shooting me. Boom, 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 boom. Four of them hit him right here. Another one bullet passed over his shoulder, hit his girlfriend in the face, killed her. He said, my body, my brain was telling me, you got to run. He said, but my body wouldn't move. He told me how he would try to move his arms and couldn't move nothing. He said, I kept hearing this gurgling coming out, and it was me. And that man walked in his house and stood over him, fired the last shot. Boom! He showed me a picture when he died in the hospital. His mother was on the foot of his bed. You could just see her. He said, and all of a sudden I lifted up out of my body and I could hear my mother screaming as they were working on me, speaking in tongues, God, no! He said, I saw the doctors frantically Working. And then I left that hospital room and I was in darkness. He said, off in the distance I saw this bright light. And it started coming towards me. He said, I was cold until I seen that light. He said, in my mind I was thinking, I've read about this. He said, when that light come up to me, I felt this warmth that I've never felt before. And a peace. He said, the light stopped said, this isn't for you. You rejected me. This is what's going to happen to you. And he said, immediately I was flying down this tunnel. He said, I was going so fast, I was trying to reach up and grab things to stop me. He said, now I was trying to dig my heels in, thinking, my God, what's going on? And demons started popping up in my face. He said, they were reaching up and they were grabbing my thighs and dragging me down into this tunnel. He said, I was fighting. I was hitting them as hard as I could, and they were just laughing at me. He said, I could smell the stench of their breath. He said, off in the distance, I seen this fire look like worms waving in the fire. He said, I got closer, and it was people pointing at me saying, don't come here. My God, don't come here. And at that moment, his mother had prayed him back. It was a miracle. There's no way this guy with 538 slugs, one through his throat, four center mass. 
should have made it. He's a fire and brimstone preacher. People start filling up the altars because he tells them, I've seen it. I have been there. Don't come here. Come on, I've come to tell you right now. I come to pull somebody out of the pits of hell. Come on, I come to tell the devil you're not getting them. Come on, he may be dragging you down right now, but I got a hold of your collar and I'm pulling back. Come on, you don't have to burn and go to hell. You can be baptized today in the name of Jesus. Your sins washed away. God will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. But it's your choice. I can't make the choice for you. I can't even come close to describing what he went through. And I study the crucifixion all the time. And you're going to choose one more time to walk out on him. You're not walking out on me. Because I prayed, I walked, if you notice, I was walking around this building when I got here. Because everywhere I put my foot, I claimed it in Jesus' name. You won't be walking out on me. You're going to be dragging your nasty feet through the blood of Jesus one more time. My God, what's it going to take to shake some of you? Some of you got one foot in the world and one in the church. Come on. God's trying to tell you right now. He sent me to tell you, you don't want to go to hell. Come on, I've come to to preach this gospel. The gospel is is the cross and Jesus crucified, but there's consequences for not accepting the message of God. Come on, I wonder who would just say, I can't take it. I've got to repent in this place today. Come on, I wonder who'd step up right now and say, I'm coming to the altar. I'm not leaving this place without putting my soul in the hands of Jesus Christ. Come on, this altar's open. Come on, don't go through another church service. Don't go through another church service without repenting. Don't go through another service without kneeling down and saying, God, forgive me of my sins. What's it going to take? This might be the last service some of you are ever in. Come on, this might be your last chance. I'm begging you, please don't gamble with your destiny. I'm begging you right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, some of you, you've been playing around with God. It's not too late. You need to put it under the blood. Come on. I'm only going to hold this altar open for a few more seconds. Come on, this is your chance to meet him. This is your chance to be be, be purified and cleansed by him. Come on, if you've never repented of your sins, this is your day to repent. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, not the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, But when they say, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's your opportunity today to have your sins washed away. Come on, that's it. All right, now, come on, everybody down here is committed. Pour your heart out to him now just for a minute.